And Arnie Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. Arnie Sherman, good Sunday morning to you. Scott, good Sunday morning to you and happy, uh, belated happy 4th of July. The, our nation's Independence Day celebration. We're getting close to 250 years, if you can believe that, since uh, the founding of the United States of America. Amazing. So uh, I was around at the very beginning myself, so I could comment, you know, contemporaneously about things that were happening back then. But, you know, it's very interesting as we're halfway through 2021 now, more than halfway through, and there's this constant um, clamor for try to reach consensus in the country, you know, um, what news is real news, what news is fake news. Um, we had a very, I, I think, newsworthy couple of week period across a whole uh, cadre of issues. You know, we had uh, a, an amazing cyber attack on 200 companies where they froze basically a 100, um, oh, excuse me, a million uh, computers and ask for a seventy million dollar ransom. It's kind of hard, I think, for people to get their head around something you know like that. You know, we also had Preston Padden, who helped launch Fox News, came out this past week and said Fox is poison for America. I'm sure that as our listeners listen, there's a visceral reaction to that. But you know, just very recently, Tucker Carlson. You know, had a court defense that, you know, in, in, that he was being, uh, you know, the, well, actually that was laid out for him by his defense attorneys that said uh, no reasonable person believes all the things they hear on Fox News. You know, so it's, a, it's an interesting time to try to do sort of a recap of, uh, you know, where we are, what's going on, what are some of the issues that, uh, that we're facing, Um you know, whether they're complex or controversial, you know, or not. And is there a possibility of ever reaching consensus on some of these, uh, you know, very challenging and important and, and heartfelt issues that you and I are concerned about and I think all our listeners are concerned about as well? I would agree, Arnie. It's been a, a, a really interesting first half of the year. When we come back, Arnie and I are going to talk to one another and kind of dig into these issues and hopefully come up with some answers. Again, as our listeners, if you have any suggestions or comments, please send them to us directly at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com or message us on Facebook. Back after this. Bernie Sherman, we are back. Yes, we are back, Scott. And uh, I thought that we would try to tackle some of these topics by talking about, you know, politics, uh, business, entertainment, and sports, but maybe begin with a little history lesson, which I, I find it. fascinating. I always try to I always try to kind of look back and see, you know, what's real and what's not real. I mean, fake news is, has dominated our lexicon, our, our uh, public discourse for the past four or five years, but it's always been an issue. You know, one of my favorite uh, quotes is uh, Winston Churchill, who once said public officials use statistics like drunks use lampposts, more for the support than illumination. You know, and so then that's true. You know, any anybody that's out there trying to sw- persuade people or sway people, take a position whether the facts support them or not, or they can manipulate and shift the facts around. So let me let me share a couple of things that I, that I think that are interesting from our history. First of all, when the United States was first founded back in 1890 and before that, but around 1890 when we were really beginning the uh, the quest as a as a country, there were less than 4 million people living here in the whole country. Right. And at the time of our you know our fight for independence, only 45% of those 4 million people supported breaking away from England. In Is that fact, right? the third a million, a third of the population then fought for the British. You know, we sometimes forget that. Everybody wanted freedom. Everybody wanted to. And the main issue that was, you know, 
promulgating the whole, you know, separation of the colonies from the British Empire was taxes. That's what, what fermented all of that. Even back then, at the founding of the country, we didn't want to pay taxes. We didn't want to have taxation without representation. And that's what led to, you know, to the, uh, you know, the beginning of the country. Sure. I look also, I took a look at World War II. In January of 1940, while Europe was engaged in war already, I mean, Hitler had moved on and taken over Poland and a number of other places, 88% of Americans opposed the war. Really? They didn't want to get involved in World War II. Six months later, it was still 65%. And even after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, where we said there was a consensus in America and a, and a fervor, you know, to fight the Germans and the Japanese, there was still almost 40% were against it, against the war, even after Pearl Harbor. And there was a combination of nationalism, isolationism, um, pacifism, you know, and then some political, you know, socialism. All the isms were sort of ganged together. So even at a time like that, you take a look at our political history. I mean, elections in this country, you, you consider them a landslide, when you still have 40% of the people voting against you, two of the two of the greatest presidents, FDR on the Democratic side, let's use Ronald Reagan, they never got more than 60% of the vote. So the four terms that uh, that uh, Truman, excuse me, the four terms that FDR got elected during the Great, you know, ending the Great Depression, guiding us and shepherding us through World War II, you know, Ronald Reagan being an inspirational leader for Republicans, 40% of the country were opposed. To, to uh, and never voted for them. So this idea, this notion that we're going to reach consensus on something, I don't really know what consensus means. Consensus, you know, generally means in, in this day and age, 51%, except in the United States Senate when you filibuster and then you got to get 60%. 60%. You know, there's a lot of, as you know, a lot of controversy about whether, you know, you should uh, get rid of the filibuster. You know, and for our listeners, the filibuster is is used in non-budgetary um, decision making in the United States Senate. Budgetary decision making only requires fifty one percent, but anything else requires sixty percent, and leads to a minority, in essence, being able to control Congress. Exactly. Because most of the bills that if something's passed in the House, it has to get ratified in the Senate, and if you know if you got to get sixty percent. You can have a minority of 40% blocking anything that happens. Arnie, why do you think that folks like Kristen Cinema and Joe Manchin, who are Democrats, are so in, are so rigid related to the filibuster? Is it because of their constituencies and their states? Well, I think, they, they, well, I think politics for a long time has abandoned this notion that we're here to do what's right for the American people. Sure. I think politics are we do what's right for our political party and we do the best we can to block anything that the other party does. I mean, our our uh, former majority leader from Kentucky, you know, Mitch McConnell said was proud to say from the day Obama got elected, I'm going to do my best to block everything he does. <laughs> Regardless right. of whether it was good for anybody or not, that was that was incidental. That was, was inconsequential to his power position is if I could block his agenda, his bills. But he went further than that. He didn't say I was going to block his radical. He just happened to block everything he does. Right. You know, and that kind of, that kind of, uh, you know, digging in your heels. So you got a guy like Joe Manchin from a state that's basically Republican now, and he has to be careful, I think. And the same with, uh, uh, our Arizona senator, and and there may be some. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to cast and throw stones at them. They they maybe do believe that there's a way to get bipartisan support, but that's only a notion that comes about when things are very evenly divided. If there were 62 Democratic senators or 62 Republican senators, they would do what they're supposed to do. We're in the majority. We're going to pass whatever we can, and we're right. going to push our agenda through. And they can ratify and it and is. change it when they get control. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I was advising the Democrats, I would say ram through all everything, your whole agenda. 
And uh, when the Republicans get control, let's see what they, uh, you know, what they cancel. Because a lot of the the agenda that they're trying to push through is very popular, right? With a majority of the country, we have a very a dysfunctional electoral process that I think if we tried to start it from scratch now, we would never create what we created. You know, for example, we have a, a situation where majority of the states can, that could control the Electoral College or can control the United States Senate have less population. 70% of the states uh, out there have about uh, 40% of the population. And they have a, they have a huge uh, uh, advantage in controlling, you know, the agenda in the country. And that's a very kind of odd set of circumstances. So you, so you have a split now that's 50-50. I'll, I'll tell you how it manifests itself. You have a 50-50 split basically in the Senate, right? Right. But the Dems represent 41 and a half million more people than the Republicans do. So it's not really 50-50 split. You know, so, and that all came about. You know, just, just, you know, this, this important tradition of the filibuster that people talk about, right? That we're, it only came about in the 1850s by South Carolina Senator John C. Calhoun, who wanted to slow down the demise of slavery. Right. <laughs> you know, and now, you know, 170 or 180 years later, it has become weaponized in a way as, a, as a, you know, a way to you know push agendas through. Right. So right, it's right. not it's not I mean, it's not something that came about at the beginning of our history as a country. It came about by one senator from South Carolina who had the power at that point. He was a powerful southern senator. He had he had the the opportunity to uh, use this tactic to slow down, to let a minority keep slavery from being abolished until Lincoln did it as president of the United States. Arnie, is it fair to say that just slowing things down and trying to get, you know, uh, with with the filibuster um, kind of doing all the blocking, that they're just playing a waiting game? It's a time thing. It's basically the Republicans versus the Democrats. They're trying to wait them out. So that well, in the midterm elections, ways. in the midterm elections, they'll be able to shift the power base. Well, they think they can because history shows that the majority party loses seats in the Congress. You know, when they when they have the uh, two year, you know, two years following when they have election again. Um, and you notice that when uh, when they had a chance to block Obama's, uh, when well, the Republicans had a chance to block Obama's Supreme Court nomination of you know Merrick Garland, they blocked it for eight and a half months. And when they had control, they pushed through two Supreme Court justices in record time. You know, so you can say all you want about camaraderie or consensus or any of those sorts of things. But it's a power game. It's become a power game. And I shouldn't say become. It's always been a power game. You know, back in the day when you had powerful House and Senate majority leaders, it wasn't this split. They had maybe 62 seats in the Senate or they had 50 or 60 or 70 extra seats in the House, either party. It wasn't this split most of the time. And so they already the opposition party knew that they couldn't get stuff done. They couldn't block it. So they would compromise. They would, you know, they would try to work together. They were trying to create a right, a happy, a happy coexistence as best they could. Yeah, However, yeah. however, I think a lot of people, because I had just read about this this week, past weekend, are under are under like the the misconception that the good old days, Reagan and Tip O'Neill, was chummy chummy, and that they would you know break bread or have a drink and kind of come up with a compromise. But if you start to listen, read some of the some of how they spoke about each other back in the day, it was filled with vitriol and with with contempt for the other person as actively as you hear it in today's politics. Right. So well, there is no there is no niceties in this. Well, as you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Right. And, you know, some people might think good that is kind of balanced in the middle. But often when you get 50-50 splits or very close um, Republican-Democrat, um, you know, 
representation, it's like putting your foot on the gas and the brake at the same time. You don't get much done. You don't get much of an agenda accomplished. Arnie, shift shift gears for a second. So yeah. filibuster is a national right issue, uh, and, and right. locally here in Missoula and in Montana, though, uh, how much does it really impact us day to day? And on the local level, what do you, how do you what do you see with local politics where there's more where there is there cooperation? You know, a lot because a lot of local uh, politicos are not you know necessarily party affiliated, although they are. We know that they have a party. So how do you see it kind of working at the ground level here in town? Well, there's the two county? kinds of there's two kinds of ways this plays itself out. If you have super majorities like we have right now, you know, the Republicans control almost every state electoral office except for one Senate, United States Senate seat, John Testers. They control a super majority in the House and, you know, the Senate so that they they are filibuster proof right and they pushed through a lot of legislation that have been around for years and years and years that have been blocked by um both uh you know brian schweitzer and uh you know our last governor got it so and the only way that the opposition can fight back now they only have one tool left which is lawsuits they challenge the legality of some of the things that are being done so when po- political parties get that kind of control, they, you know, they push very hard and they get their agenda done. And then what often happens is there's an infighting between that party because the other party becomes inconsequential. It's like, you know, in some states, like in New York, the Democrats have controlled the state legislature and city, leg- you know, the city politics for a long time. And Republicans are, you know, inconsequential in, in much of this. And, the, you know, the Democrats fight among themselves. I mean, look. How many people are running for mayor? Mayor of New York is going to be a Democrat. And, you know, there were, I don't know, eight of them, nine of them that were running. You know, they had to do a right voting system to try to try to sort it to all out. To clean everything up. Still haven't sorted it out. Well, I, I do think about when we interviewed Brian Schweitzer earlier this year, we talked a lot about how policy is created and made. He was incredibly sobering. And really talked about whoever is in power and has the power base is going to push through their policy by hook or crook. And there are consultants and there are dark money that really rules the day. And so while you well, have- that's true. And, and in the era of supposed fake news, um, you're not sure what their agenda really is. You know, they say what they have to say to get elected. And then once they're in office, if they have, you know, bulletproof majorities, who knows what kind of policies they put in place? Who knows what, you know, they can, you know, what kind of havoc. Now, some people might say, well, hey, I don't care. I voted for this guy. He got a majority of the vote. Let's see what he can do. Sure. Let's back away and see what he can do. But in an era where we have so much, you know, information, you know, so much manipulation of media with click baiting and and all of that those sort of things you know we're we're drowning in information but we're starved for knowledge and it's very hard for people to figure out what is true you know we you know the big lie has been around for a long long time you know the big lie that we now have is that the election was rigged that trump really won you know, the pillow guy saying August 13th, Trump's going to be put back in office because all the communists, you know, I mean, there's that kind of rant, lunatic rants going on. And some people believe it. But the big lie has been around a long time. The people who said the earth is flat, that no men landed on the moon. And the one that bothers probably you and I the most is the Holocaust never happened. There are Holocaust deniers. Right, of course. But but there is, but there is a, you know, there is a, an efficacy in some way to the thing. If you say the lie enough, people start questioning it and believe, you know, believe it. Are you surprised, Arnie, that there, I mean, there are people that I consider highly intelligent that have really important jobs that really get sucked into some of these conspiratorial kind of uh, this conspiratorial thinking and these and these plays that are out there. Uh, why is that? Is it just because if it's repeated enough, they'll, they'll buy into well, it? Some of it's repeated. Some of it's, some of it's human nature. Some of it is, you know, I think personal 
preferences. For example, let me give you an example. You just bought a brand new Corvette. You search out information that says Corvette is a great car. You don't like information that says the car you just bought sucks, right? It's human nature. So you elect Donald Trump and you support him and then you, you know, you, people are attacking him and then you seek out information to, you know, show why you were right. You know, and, uh, you know, he's your leader. You bought into him. You support him. You know, you might say, oh, he's crude and has a different way. I've heard people say, you know, he likes to shake things up. He's a change agent, you know, and then, then he, you know, then he loses and because of his own ego, he starts perpetuating the big lie. I mean, there's not a single real authority on election, you know, history or, you know, data analysis that says there's any significant voter fraud anywhere in the country. You know, Montana's had a voter fraud hotline for, for 20 years, and they've never gotten a phone call. I mean, there isn't voter fraud. But if you say it enough and you say, hey, you know, I don't understand computers. Some Russian space laser can change the outcome. <laughs> and then you start putting fact to that. You say, well, how come? So it changed the you know, outcome for Donald Trump. But every all the other Republicans won in the state. How did that happen? And then they just dig their heels in and say, well, that's not relevant. You know, it's just, you know, they, they you can't get a good answer to, you know, facts. Facts are stubborn things. Obviously. The problem is that facts have been, have been, you know, yes, exactly. And you can't, you know, for almost any wacky position that, you know, they're drinking baby's blood and space lasers are controlling the electoral process. You say that enough and a certain portion of the population is going to believe it. Believe. Well, Arnie, let's shift gears for a quick second because you, yeah. you you've talked in the beginning about someone like a Tucker Carlson in Fox News, and yeah. and is someone like that? I mean, you brought up a great point, which is the founder of Fox News or the architect of Fox News has actually said this experiment has gone wrong. Uh, what yeah. is that about? You know. Well, I think that you it's it's part of the legacy of Rupert Murdoch who had a history of coming up with exploitive journalism, and that's his, you know, they built a strong following and a strong base. And if you watch it, you know, you can't be factless all the time. You know, there are people on there like Chris Wallace and Britt Hume and others who have some, you know, every once in a while there's enough rational conversation, you know, but then you have people like Tucker. Now, one of the things I think that you often forget is that they are not – he's not a newsman. He's, an, he's, he's a, edit, doing editorial comment. He's sharing his perspective. He's as much a newsman as Howard Stern's a newsman. Right. Right? True. But right. they have popular followings. They have popular followings. And Tucker gets – you know, he you know he builds up a whole, you know, a cadre of, of and stirring things up, you know, just like Rush did and – you know, there and were just like Trump, said, well, just like Trump did. Entertainment. But just yeah, like Trump yeah. did. Those are, no, that's, those are his minions. Arnie, I read a headline. You know, and he, I know, but I read a headline today that said, in the Hill, that said, have Tucker Carlson and Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, filled the void, the Trump void, for the left. Right? So Trump's out of the picture. Are these guys yeah. sucking up all the oxygen on the far right side? What do you think about that? Well, you know, I mean, somebody's got it. I mean, this is all you have so much media hitting you that somebody needs to, you know, there's a fight and there's always a fight. And, and how do you get more media attention by being more controversial? You know, remember, I mean, you, I'm older than you. And I remember when there were critical events going on in the world, Cuban Missile Crisis, whatever, you turn to Walter Cronkite. You put on CBS News and Walter Cronkite told you facts. He didn't editorialize. He just told – and you believed what he said. But that was when there was only three networks, and they were pretty much similar in the way they presented news. Now, somebody might say, well, they were controlled and they try to minimize things. And, all. you know, sure, a lot of – you know, those kinds of things happen. But today you have hundreds of choices, and they're all fighting. So how do you get – how do you – how do you come out on top? You don't come on up on top by being Mr. Rogers. You get up on top by saying controversial things and attacking, you know, 
you know, you get you, you Tucker Carlson, you say Biden's been a disaster. Sixty two percent of the population thinks he's doing a good job. That's almost a good, that's almost, you know, I mean, you know, that's as good as you're going to get. And he said he's been a disaster ever since he's been. He's been a disaster. Stock market's doing pretty good. You know, COVID, you know, the COVID vaccine's going out pretty well. You right. know, we're doing, you know, I don't wake up every morning saying, what the hell, you know, what kind of mess have we got ourselves into today? But they're saying he's horrible, terrible, just because they want people to because be they're agitated saying, and pay attention to him. Well, they're comparing Tucker Carlson. CNN just came out with a report comparing Tucker Carlson to his views on the, on the level of, uh, Alex Jones, right? Somebody who had, who had been booted right. off the air. And so that just goes to show you how far things have gone over just even though. Well, last both of them used months. this. Right. Well, both of them used the same defense when they were in the court. Their lawyers came up with the same defense, which is no reasonable person would believe all the things they say. They're not designed to tell you the truth. They're designed to be comment on what's going on and be huh. controversial. Arnie, let's shift gears for a second. Yeah, sure. Okay. We're talking about the power of the media. We're talking about right. the power of entertainment. Let's go to sports for a second. Yeah, because, a lot going on in sports, Scott. Well, there, there really is. And I think here locally, you know, you've brought this up in the past. We've done it with our guest, um, with Ken Haslam. We talked about the NCAA and the ability for athletes, NCAA athletes, to start being paid and earning money based on, you know, their uh, being used in commercials and promotions and sponsorships. Right. And now that's a reality. And what's, you right. know, what's your, I mean, let's talk about your take on that, and then let's talk about sports in general, because you and I are big sports fans. Yeah. Well, it has never been more clear that sports are entertainment. Then now all these all these signs that you're seeing, the ones about um, the portal for college players to be able to move around easier and play right away, pay, paying athletes, collegiate ish, athletes for using their images and giving them a salary for what they do because coaches make millions and schools make millions off of their work. Um, Baseball changing the rules. I mean, you know, we, we've we I see it happen. I've been a baseball fan for my whole life. All of a sudden, double headers are seven innings. Each of the game is seven innings long instead of nine innings. Why, you know? And then if it's if you're got a tie, you put a man at second base and try to score. Why is that? Because they thought baseball is getting boring, so they make those changes, and it's still boring to some people. So then they say no more substances on the ball. Every pitcher used substance on the ball that I know of. You know, Babe Ruth used substances on the bat and drank, you know, elixirs and did all kinds of stuff. They're trying to make it more entertaining for the audience. The NBA, as you know, you're a big NBA guy. They've changed the rules to make it more higher scores, less defense, you know, right? And, uh, you know, letting, uh, you know, they used to have the Shaq attacks. You know, Shaq would get away with everything. But now LeBron, you know, you know, and uh, – um, what's his name? The Greek freak, as they call him, being able to use the Euro step. Giannis. I mean, he, yeah. Uh, yeah. He, 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 for me, when I watch, he travels every time he goes underneath the basket based on the, you know, 20 year ago rule about traveling. Takes that little hop step and then takes another step. <laughs> yeah. So all it's of three steps. Is, is, yeah. Yeah. You're not supposed to do it. It's all because sports has become a huge moneymaker and more and more entertainment-oriented. They're going to do a new NBA franchise, probably in Las Vegas. The owners are going to have to pay the league $3 billion for that franchise, probably. Amazing. And if you watch any of the Golden Knights hockey team out of Vegas, they put on a show that's like a Las Vegas, you know, show. I mean, it's, you know, they got dancers and, you know, and, uh, you know, acrobats and all this, you know, kind of, it's, it's become an entertainment venue. Uh, Already I more fights. Yeah, well, a lot more of everything. Arnie, I pulled a statistic, a set of statistics I want to quiz you on because yeah. you're an astute guy. Yes, you know how me. Forbes every year comes yeah. out with the most valuable franchises in professional sports, okay? Yes. And I know you know this, but I don't know that you know it in the order. Of right. Who's one, two, that. and three. But right. let me just ask you, who do you think are one, two, and three in terms of 
sports franchises with the the greatest valuation, the greatest value. Who do you Across think all is? sports? All sports. I'll give you a hint. Is this U.S.? You. Is this U.S. or global? That's a great question. For the top three, they're all U.S. I'll okay. also let you know that they're in each of the major leagues and don't even consider hockey to be part of that. So you know what the major right. leagues are. So who's yes. number one? Yeah. Right? New York Yankees. That's number two. Value well, that is at, dodgy. Hold on, hold on. So yeah. the New York Yankees is number two, valuation yeah. of five point two five billion, a fifty four percent change in the past five years. They were purchased and they in sucked. 19- and they, they were- sucked for five years. Hold on, Marty. This yeah. will be greater for you. They were purchased in nineteen seventy three by the Steinbrenner family for eight point eight million dollars. They're now valued at That's a five point two five billion. That's a pretty good return. Marty, who's number one? You know, it's not in the MLB. No, it's probably the uh, Lakers. Arnie, I'm yes. going to tell you there is an NBA franchise, but guess who they are? And they're not number one. You're not going to tell me. You're not going to tell me the Knicks. Exactly, the Knicks are number three. <laughs> the, the Knicks are number three. Valuation five billion dollars. Five year change of sixty seven percent. And Madison Square Garden. Really? Order. And what, what did they pay originally for? Hold on, they were purchased in '97, and they were paid were paid 300 million in '97. Okay, they bought them, I think, from ITT and Paramount. Your Lakers are are number yeah. seven on the list at 4.6. Really? Billion. I thought the Lakers would have been higher. Arnie, I thought the Lakers, Lakers would have been higher than that. All right, so now number yeah, two is the Yankees. Number three is the New York Knicks. Who's number one? They're in the NFL. Think hard. Well, you got to take a look at the. Yeah, I don't think it's. I, I don't think. Um, let me let me just think about this for a second. I don't want to take up uh, all of our <laughs> listeners. Well, it has to be. I would have to say, if I had a guess, as much as I hate them. <laughs> Because they're America's team. It's got to be Dallas Cowboys. Bingo. Ding, 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 ding. You are right. It is. And you know why I said that? Because they got a multi-billion dollar stadium. That new stadium they built has to be worth a heck of a lot. And it's owned by the team. Follow the money. You're 100% correct. Dallas Cowboys valuation $5.7 billion, the richest in all professional sports. Five-year change of value of 43%. The owner is Jerry Jones. Purchased in 1989, price paid $150 million. Okay? Wow. You do not yep. start seeing the international players until four, the Barcelona Soccer Club at 4.75. And then yeah, I thought Barcelona would be. Okay, several football because they clubs. have what's his name, uh, you know, the, the most, the highest paid athlete in the world plays for Barcelona. Barcelona, you were right the first. And then Gardens, uh, Golden Bar- State. Bar- yeah, the Barcelona. <laughs> Ar- Arnie, Gar- yeah. Golden State is the number two NBA franchise ahead of the Lakers at $4.7 billion. But Arnie, we talk about sports yeah. and entertainment. We talk about the values, the evaluations of these teams. This is the thing that I think is is driving everything, and it goes back to media, which is, what drives the true value of these teams are the rights that they get from TV contracts. Oh, of course. If there wasn't TV, that would, they wouldn't have any money. They Well, that's a great point. So I, I just broke out a figure from the New York Knicks, who I used to work for. 60% of their of their revenue is derived from sport from rights. 40% from ticket sales, right. sponsorships, food, merchandise, etc. So – People have the misconception to think that, oh, my God, the more tickets they sell, the more butts in seats, they're going to make more money. It's all about rights. And those are traditionally deals that are locked well, you in couldn't, for many years. You couldn't pay LeBron's salary for the Lakers out of ticket sales. Exactly. You don't get $40 million. I mean, it's just, you know, profit, profit to pay him. You know, these salaries have gone up so astronomically. That's exactly you right. Know, when, that's how, uh, I mean, it's TV rights. Yeah, I remember when uh, Mickey Mantle in 1968 was the highest paid player in baseball. He made a hundred thousand dollars a year. And, you know, right. and uh, the famous line about Babe Ruth when they say you make twice as much money as the president of the United States. I think he was paid two hundred thousand, and the president was made was making a hundred thousand. And Babe Ruth said, "Well, I had a better year than he had." 
Amazing. Arnie, <laughs> and just to put a, and to put a fine point on these rights, yeah. 20, $22.4 billion of all our U.S. sports rights in 2019, which represents about 44% of the total worldwide market. So, yes, the U.S. is going to be the biggest, right? But 44 yep. live sports broadcasts account for 44 of the top 50 list of most watched television broadcasts in the United States in 2016. So, well, that includes, well you that don't includes, know the outcome. Uh, championship. It includes championship fights like Floyd Merriweather and others that made huge amount of money off of, uh, you know, the, uh, the pay for view versions of their fight. That's the only way they make, they can make that kind of money. You know, Mer- Merriweather made more in one fight than Muhammad Ali made in his whole career. Exactly. Exactly. And the International Olympics, NBC holds the rights. Right. $7.75 billion contract. That's why the Olympics are happening this year. <laughs> Yeah, and then they they and then they they make money off of that contract because they get sponsors to pay more than that to them. Yeah, so, so it's probably about a ten billion dollar contract right now. Guess what? Yeah. March Madness is an eight point eight billion dollar contract. That was as far back as two thousand and eighteen. So probably over north of 10, than now. ten now. So anyway, yeah. when we worried about why athletes are getting asking to have their hand out to get a piece of the pie from the NCAA. Listen, look at these numbers. Look yeah. at these, look at these well, numbers. Well, here's the problem I see. Here's the problem I see for my, for a University of Montana or Montana State, you know, or even smaller schools. Players are going to get hip to all this, and they're going to see, you know, what's Notre Dame offering me in football? What's USC going to offer me? You know, and, uh, you know, what's Montana going to offer me? Now, we don't always compete with those schools, but – you know, we might be in a situation in the big sky where somebody, you know, like a California school, like Sacramento State, whose TV rights might be more than a Montana TV contract, or the other way around, maybe it's different, will be able to pay athletes a lot more and offer more incentives to athletes and more signing bonuses and have more things put in place for them to do in a place like Sacramento or UC Davis or, you know, Seattle, places well, like that. Well, Arnie, you've opened the door to another good segue, which is the following. True, right? This market right now can't necessarily support a superstar NCAA athlete because all the larger markets can. But let's talk about our market, Missoula, Montana, as a housing market and how everybody's moving here. And how this market starts to completely explode, has exploded, let's say, over the last 18 months. You know, will there be a day that uh, Missoula demands a superstar player because there are 300,000 people that are in the well, valley? Here's the interesting, here's the interesting um, data point on that. Yeah. Missoula, Missoula and Bozeman and, uh, you know, Big Sky and Big Fork and, um, uh, you know, um, Whitefish are all places where the real estate markets are exploding. Maybe not so much in Helena and Great Falls and a few other places. But I've been on conversations in the last few weeks with people living in diverse places around the United States, from Las Vegas to Delaware to South Florida, and they're telling me the same thing. Housing costs are exploding in those markets. So it's not everybody coming to Montana. We see it here because we're close to, you know, Silicon Valley, Los Angeles, Seattle, and there are people coming back to Montana from there, and there are businesses moving from there to uh, to Montana and other places. They're also moving to Utah, and they're moving to, uh, you know, Coeur d'Alene. Coeur d'Alene's real estate market is exploding. So maybe this should be presented as moving from big congested cities to more easier places to have some sort of life balance as telecommunication allows it to happen, and as one of the unforeseen consequences of the COVID pandemic, which was you can work from home and it doesn't matter where you live. Boom. That led to a lot of people fulfilling their fantasy of getting out of the 700-square-foot apartment in San Francisco that cost them $3 million and come to Montana and buy a, 
you know, maybe a five hundred thousand dollar house that they had to pay seven hundred for now, but they just put two point three million in the bank. That's some of the economic dynamics, I think, of what's happening. What's interesting is what's going to happen when some of these companies change their mind and say, "You got to come back to work in the office." No, oh, yeah, that's a great point. And some of them are doing that. Companies that have allowed for flex time, a number of them have big real estate holdings. And so they've told their employees, you can choose between coming back or staying home. And you know what they're finding? They all want to stay home. And I don't believe staying at home is as productive as going to the office. Plus, you lose other things by staying at home. You don't have the unintentional learning that happens when you're in a collegial environment, where you have people around you, where you can call a meeting together. It's much different for you, Scott, when you're at the uh, when you're at town square, if you've got an issue or problem, to go out and say, everybody get in my office and let's brainstorm this. And when you have to Zoom it and set the meeting up for tomorrow at 10 o'clock and see who's available and all that kind of stuff, you can't, you lose the spontaneity of all of that. And so a number of these companies, I think, are doing research, and I think the research is going to show that people are not as productive at home. They got kid issues. They don't work. It. I, I think it's going to turn them into as long as the pandemic subsides and we have, you know, vaccines and all that. I think they're going to be uh, um, more people going back. Not, not everybody. There's still going to be flex and there's still some industries that don't need to be there. Accountants don't necessarily have to be in the office or programmers don't necessarily have to be at the office. But in some cases, when you're doing marketing and sales, when you're doing international business, when you're in the business of setting up new relationships, you cannot set up a new relationship with everybody digitally. Right. It just doesn't work. No. No. One of, I mean, one of the only cultures, things. There are many cultures that don't allow that don't that are, don't show emotion, and emotion is one of the indicators when you're working, you know, digitally uh, of of. Uh, authenticity of people that you're working with that they, you know, they emote and, and, you know, they, they show their inner, uh, you know, inner sides. They talk about personal things. Many cultures don't do that. So how do you, how do you form a bond with somebody? Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things spinning around all that. And, uh, the, one of the, one of the uh, major issues, and we had this issue before COVID was rising home costs, the disparity between working people, and, you know, blue-collar, white-collar, white-collar people or, you know, making m- more money. A place like Missoula with maybe now, even now, the average family, I think the average family income is maybe 60000 in Missoula. But a $60,000 family of four can't afford a $500,000 house or a $600,000 house. They just can't afford it. And that's what houses are going for. You, you, know, you know what the real estate market is like here. It's worse than Bozeman. You know, so how do you how do you do this? And I believe and this is, you know, I don't know what our listeners are going to think, but I think this whole thing about minimum wage and raising the minimum wage is a false narrative in a way. Minimum wage was never designed to support families. Minimum wage was designed for entry level experience and for new people getting into the labor market. No one, when we were growing up, expected to live on min- on a minimum wage job. When we, when I was a kid, the minimum wage was a buck fifteen. You know, nobody. I mean, I got a job as a seventeen year old kid making thirty, forty bucks a week. It was never. I didn't know one father or mother in my extended family that were working minimum wage jobs. It's you know, really- so I think. I think. We have to talk about living wages for working people that have professional jobs like teachers and bank tellers and jobs that are, you know, beyond the first entry level kind of job. Because those jobs are not designed to support families. I don't think working as a waiter, you shouldn't be able to support a family of four. Exactly. You know, unless you're working at La Bernardine in New York. Or you're a doorman in a building in New York. It's more of a living wage issue. You know, and then you have the cost of, you know, you have inflation. One of the consequences of our economic policies of the last six or eight years of spending way more than we take in, you know, is that you're going to get inflation. And now we're starting to see it. So you see prices going up. You see what it costs to build a house. 
you've you've renovated a, new, uh, a second home. What was the cost of that? It was probably startling to you as you went out and tried to figure out how, how much you had to spend to remodel something. It goes fast. Arnie, let's do this. By the way, we have a separate show yeah. that we'll, we should have about inflation. We can bring in our get, one of our friends, yeah. Bob Seidenschwartz, to talk all about that. He, he's very yeah. conversant in that. Yes. But let's take a quick break, and let's, in our last quick few moments, talk a little bit more about the housing here in, in Missoula and the pricing and just where we see that going. Back after this with Arnie Sherman and Scott Richmond, and what do you know? Arnie, we are back with our final segment where we were talking about local Missoula real estate and the rising housing costs. It's a real dilemma, and I don't have any good answers, frankly. I mean, people people talk about building affordable housing for or workforce housing. You know, we have some other issues here, which is, you know, limitations of land. Um, not very many. Um, I mean, the, the workforce in the construction trades is tapped out. You can't get somebody. I think you're looking for somebody right now to do some, some work and you can't find somebody to, you know, on a personal right. level, you know, and, and jobs, you know, we, we, you can't raise salaries enough to compete with what's going on because out of state people are coming in and driving the prices up. Then that may not last forever. They may, they're going to stop coming here from California and from Washington when they can't sell their houses and their markets because of, you know, whatever happens. And I think, you know, I think the thing that's going to happen is interest rates are going to go up. This whole real estate market is driven by really low interest rates. And so, you know, $500,000 is a lot more than 400,000, but if you're only paying two and a quarter and you spread it over 40 years and do a balloon, it becomes affordable, right? And that's the way they're doing it. Right, it's a hundred bucks a month or something yeah, silly yeah. like that. Right, or not even. If rates go up a point or two. It's going to change the whole metrics of of what's happening. Arnie, just to recap, okay, yes. today's show because I love a show like this where we kind of do a half year review. We start teasing out subjects. We talked about the media. We talked about the power of the media. We talked about the power of conspiratorial media and how effective and influential it is. We talked about sports, and that really spoke to the ballooning uh, values of sports teams and rights and how that pays for the salaries. And now should the NCAA, the, the athletes are going to be getting money now for rights. And, you know, we talked about housing, right, and local yes. Missoula. And, Arnie, if you could put a bow around all of it, what do you think the common theme is with everything? Well, the common thing is – that this issue of trying to reach consensus or everybody being on the same team is not an, is not an American um, um, historical um, phenomenon. We've always had, you know, diversity, and we've always had discord from the from the day the country was founded. So I think that's not the issue we should focus on. You're never going to achieve something like getting everybody to agree. What you have to do is come up with sound policy, and you're going to have to uh, elect people that represent your perspective and your point of views. And if, and uh, and that's the way it's always been. And you can't put the genie back in the bottle. No, no, you can't do that. Right, like that's the world sure. progress is always happening. Whether it's you're in agreement with it or not is another question. But things are always happening, and Technology has enabled so much of this. Well, I think it's I think it's the proliferation of news outlets and sources of media, and then a lack a lack of time to vet it all. I mean, I I always do a quiz with people when they tell me about an article that they've read. I said, "Who wrote it?" And I can tell you, ninety nine percent of the time, they have no idea who authored an article. Right. It's just out there, and they you know are repeating it without having ever checked on whether what they're saying is is a valid point. A hundred percent agree. This was a delightful show, Arnie. I yeah, enjoyed it's always doing fun this. to try to recapitulate things with you. I love I love it. I love talking about it and we have a lot more subjects to cover over the next couple of weeks and months. So I'm looking forward to it. Anyway, Arnie, it was a great show. I will see you next week. Yeah, see you next week, Scott. It was great talking with you. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know? 
I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO. about businesses that are selling through the roof, like Aloe or Allbirds or Skims. Sure, you think about a great product, a cool brand, and brilliant marketing. But an often overlooked secret is actually the businesses behind the business, making selling simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. Nobody does selling better than Shopify, home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not-so-secret secret? With ShopPay that boosts conversions up to 50%, meaning way less carts going abandoned and way more sales going. So if you're into growing your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell whatever your customers are scrolling or strolling on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout Skims uses. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash try to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash try.